Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. Thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architectures, uh, I can speak today, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Purbank. Today Donna will discuss master data management, practical strategies for integrating into your data architecture. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of the screen to activate that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA Strategies. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you the series speaker, uh, Donna Burbank. She is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She is currently the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked in, with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna get, to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello. Thanks, Shannon. Always a pleasure to do these. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm, I see it's a lot of familiar faces on the attendee list, and I appreciate uh, those who join fairly regularly because, as you may know, this is a, a series. So we have started in January with a, a good wide range of lineup, um, and they are all on demand. I know that's always a, a question from folks. So any of the past that may be of interest to you are on demand. Um, in this webinar, when we are finished, we'll be on demand, not only with the slides, but with the recording, and Shannon and her team send that out after the event. Um, so today's topic is on master data management, and more importantly around master data is practical strategies for integrating master data management into your wider data architecture. Um, and without further ado, we'll get started. So you may have seen this from the abstract, but really, what is master data? So, you know, it has to do with getting that view of that critical data around customers and products. And a lot of people want to do that, but they, they may think that's overly complex, right? Doesn't that seem too hard? And I've heard a lot of my customers this year say that it seems like something I want to do, but isn't that just too hard? Well, it is, it, like anything, it can be hard, but I think if you do it right and you pick the right approach, the right architecture, and importantly, the right governance, you can really see success, some success, and we'll show some success stories around that. Um, and so, again, you may have seen this. This is a framework we use in my practice, and it's got some, some good feedback. One of the reasons I use it is that, you know, before you do anything, you look at the business strategy, and we'll talk about that specifically with MDM. Um, and you'll see that MDM is listed there as a box, um, but it's part of a wider strategy. So if you don't know why you're doing master data and it's not aligned with your business, it, it may have issues. If you're not using governance as part of your master data strategy and you don't have the right stewardship around that, it's going to have issues. If you don't understand your existing data assets and the integration and the metadata around that, those can also be a challenge. And then, you know, what, what data, what information are you, are you mastering, right? Is it in data sources, is it in CRM systems, is it in PIM systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you really need to look holistically at MDM as part of a wider strategy and go from there. Um, so just to start, basic fundamentals. I'm an architect, so I always like to kind of see core fundamental principles. You know, when we think of master data, that's the core entities of the enterprise. So your customers, your prospects, if you're a, you know, a, a government, it could be your citizens, right? If you're a manufacturer, it could be your suppliers, your sites. Also the hierarchies around that. Um, and I took these definitions from Gartner um, off their sort of technical data dictionary, but I, I think I like them. <laughs> they, 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 they're they a nice simple way to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about master data. And then master data management, it could be just sort of obvious it's the management of master data, but it is a bit more than that. It's not only getting the uniformity and accuracy and around that information, but it's things like the stewardship. Who's, who's the one that's going to check this golden record, make sure it's right? What business processes around that? What's the accountability around these shared assets? Because they really are um, the assets of your organization. So if you're thinking of something like customer and you're a retailer, not much more is important than that, right? But there is other things that are important, your suppliers, right, your products. Um, so it really is getting a center core around these core information assets. 
So um, many of you may be aware, we did a survey last year on trends in data architecture, and master data management, of course, was one of the trends we took a look at, right? So who, a lot of talk about master data management, it is a hot topic in the industry, which is one of the reasons we chose this. Um, who's actually doing it? And we noticed uh, from the results that over 65% were actually actively pursuing an MDM strategy at various stages of maturity, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But I think that's a fair percentage, and the more interesting thing is that it is on the rise. And I find that interesting because almost all of the topics that we pick in this series, whether it's master data, whether it's data modeling, whether it's um, metadata, we're seeing an increase in those, even though you may say those are sort of foundational and they've been around for a long time, isn't that the old stuff? Well, what's old is new again, so I'm actually seeing a massive resurgence in my practice with MDM and people being interested in it. So when we asked a little deeper in the survey about, okay, you, you're interested in MDM, but where are you on your MDM journey? Because it is a journey. MDM is not a project where you start and then you're done in a few weeks or a few months and then it's done. It, it should become embedded in your business processes and your way of working and into your architecture. Um, so we asked a further question of where are you? Are you actively uh, using it, but in the initial stages, which is sort of that lower level of maturity? Are you at a high level of maturity, or are you just beginning? And you'll see that the largest percentage there is really just beginning. A very small percentage was not considering, um, and then kind of a few, I'm not really sure. <laughs> but um, so I think that, again, is showing that trend of people uh, just beginning this journey and wanting to know more. So we're going to open it up to you in the panel. I'd be curious where you are in your MDM journey. Are you in your early stages? Have you been doing it for a while? Are you the process of beginning but have not really implemented or are you not considering it at all? So I'm going to pass it to Shannon to kind of open up the survey and see where you stand. The poll is open. All right. We need. I do need some Jeopardy music for this. <laughs> <laughs> I would sing, but yeah, you don't want me singing. <laughs> and we got a few people responding, but. Is it slow? Is there anything people need to click, or it should be obvious? I have to find it on my interface. But... Yeah, they've changed things around a little bit, but uh, looks like we've got some good. Um, looks like it's going to be a tie between the first and third ball is A and C. Oh, and the poll is closing. It is calculating. Drum roll, please. Excitement. <laughs> I wish it calculated much faster, but it doesn't. <laughs> I know Shannon tries to convince me not to do these polls, but I'm a stubborn <laughs> old lady and I keep doing it. But I'm curious. I like to make it interactive, as you can see. All right, here All are the right. poll results. All right, you are right that sort of a lot of people are in the process of beginning or in the early stages, which may be self defining because it may be why you are joining a webinar to learn more about it. So, but that also helps me in the context um, as we go through this webinar to kind of see where you are in your stages. So thank you for looking at, looks like a couple people are in the high stages. So um, I know there's always an active chat during these. So anyone who is actually in the high stages of doing this and wants to share their experiences, people ask questions, please do that as well. That is one of the benefits of data diversity. There's always great feedback between people and nice Q&A. So without further ado, um, moving along, I can't seem to be able to move my own slide. Okay, so one of the, the main reasons of what is MDM, right? One of the classic ones is that single view of customer and kind of getting that single view. Um, and I like to kind of tell that through a story, right? So do we even understand our customers? So one of it is just, can we get a single record of Stefan Krauss and what age he is, right? But you can also sort of start to link that with other things. What is his address? This this gentleman lives in Pontresina, Switzerland, right? He's a ski instructor. So but maybe some more in, interesting things, this is a ski gear company. He's been in our program, loyalty program for a certain amount of years. He um, has purchased a certain amount of gear. He buys all online on his cell phone, and he prefers text messages rather than figure physical snail mail. Uh, and he skiers in the call. He finishes the Engadine Ski Marathon in, in 2015. Um, so we kind of know some things about his purchasing patterns as well. So you can get a lot of very interesting information about your customer as well as some sort of the basics. But really where that comes in, and I've had several customers in the recent years that I've been working that have had this very similar scenario. So when we talk about um, 
customer. There's so much we could do to get that full view. We could do social media analysis and we can get credit history and all of these things. But if you can't get that core golden record of who is Stefan Krauss, um, the, none of that else matters. So in this example, is it Stefan Krauss who's a ski instructor in 31? Um, or is it Stefan Krauss who's a banker in 62, right? The same name, but one maybe is a father, one is a son, maybe there's no correlation at all. So just getting that, mat that match is key. So why is that important? Uh, well, Stefan Krauss, he's a banker, he lives in Zurich. He actually doesn't ski or do anything at all, but he makes a lot of money. So he actually has purchased more gear than the ski instructor, right? Because he has a lot of money and when he spends, he does it on holiday. He likes to buy it in a store and he wants a piece of mail. And he doesn't really use the equipment other than staying warm because he watches football. But he's been a member of your loyalty program, but not very active, right? So those are all very interesting insights, but it all comes back to do I even know who my customer is? Which Stefan Krauss is it? And we probably all have those stories of getting that wrong or getting that right, but that is core. So you can't add the nice flashy stuff around it unless you actually know some of the core of how do I match, how do I merge, how do I get the survivorship around who is Donna Burbank, who is Stefan Krauss, who is, you know, Shannon Kemp, right? We need to get that information. So another sort of question that comes up or misunderstanding, um, as people talk about master data is what it is. And that may be obvious to some of us on the call, um, but it may not be. So I thought it might be worth kind of talking that through. So if this is a typical kind of keep that ski analogy through, if this is your transaction data, you kind of have a customer, Stefan Krauss, he bought a Telemark ski boot with a certain code. He bought that in Europe, so it was Europe and St. Mertz, Switzerland. That's your, that, that, those are your transactions. And, and a way of thinking about that is that's a verb. That kind of describes the action. You know, how many products did he buy? When did he buy it? When did a patient come in for an appointment? All of these sort of transactional information. But from that, you can really start to build out the nouns, which are more of the who. So um, I'll just go back to the previous slide, sorry. The, the you know, the, what, who is the customer? Who's the product? What location are those around? And then build out the attributes around that. So in my example, you know, Donna Burbank lives in Boulder, Colorado, and Stefan Krauss lives in St. Moritz, Switzerland. Well, there's some there's information around there, and they all are different types, either master data or transaction data or reference data. So I thought it might be helpful to kind of walk through that. So again, the transaction data, those are the, the verbs, um, the, those transactions with the date on them. You'll see that the master data would be the customer, the fact that I have a Wendy Hu and a John Smith and a Stefan Krauss and a Donna Burbank. And then you also have product master data. What are the core product codes? Are your product codes different in Europe than in the US? Do they have different prices? Are there hierarchies between those codes? Is there sort of a telemark ski hierarchy or a, a clothing hierarchy or a yoga pant? Is that in the same category as ski wear? Right? All, if you're in retail, understand all that hierarchy and complexity around just product data. But then there's also around your location. Is this the location where the customer lives? Is it where they bought? More likely, this is probably the store. And do you have a master record of all your stores or retailers or suppliers? Is this a supplier or is it our own retail store? You know, all of the questions around that, those can be your master data. There's also a category, and one could argue, and we do in data management a lot, uh, is this master data or is it reference data? So under the reference data, I would say that might be things like your codes, like is, is CO Colorado, and therefore a uh, state code, and CH is a country code. It's, there's still a two-letter code, and there's some co commonality there, but they're very different things, and you want to have that valid list. What the last thing you want is when you're building a warehouse, you're trying to find Donna Burbank, and in one system it has CO, and the next one has Colorado, and the next one it has Massachusetts, because that's where I used to live when I was a kid, right? You want not only a consistent terms, but also a consistent global record, right? So. I thought it was worth kind of those core based principles um, just before we get started into the rest. So another kind of system view of master data, and there's different ways of doing this. You can have a centralized approach. I'm, I'm actually sort of a fan of the centralized approach for many reasons, but there's different uh, ways you can do that. You can do it more distributed. Um, but if we take the classic sort of golden record at the center, um, and I'm putting MDM, that's your master data, that may be customer or supplier in this case, and I have the reference data as kind of a little cousin to it over to the left, but in this case, we're this big customer as an example. That may live in many source systems, and they all have their own unique identif you know, reason for, for being and their own definition. So I often get the question, why do we have MDM when we have a CRM system? Isn't that our customer master? Well, 
sort of. Um, or the same thing will come up with why do we have MDM for a product when we have a PIM or a product information system, and the list goes on. They really have a different functionality and purpose. So yes, you may only have one system that has customer information, but a CRM, as you know, um, it's really understanding the customer and their transactions and their history and whether they're a prospect. Or There's a lot of functionality just built for purpose for that, which is different from matching is this the right customer data with, with this Donna Burbank that lives in a certain um, address. The other piece is if you think of MDM as less of, and it can be both, so I'm not going to belittle the, the fact that it is a single store of information or a single logical view of information. It doesn't all physically have to be stored in one place, um, but say it were in this case. Um, it can push it back out to the system. So I have identified that Donna Burbank has a, a name and an address, but maybe on the online sales store, we also have her oh, credit card information, if you can store that, or her gender, right? So maybe name and age comes from the CRM and gender comes from the online sales store. You may create that golden record for different systems. So we kind of walk through that MDM data model can either be, and one can argue which is the best approach, either the subset from all those source systems. Maybe each subset has, you know, if one of the entities of the seven entities you want to store, right? So we get the name from one system, and the address from the other, and the age from another, and the gender from another, and we create this perfect golden record from that. Um, or in some cases, it's more of a superset that each one of these only has one, and there's no one place that has all of that together. And you can argue the semantics or whatever. But the idea is that all of the information that we want about a customer in this example, we want the correct value, we want the, the values that we care about, we want to be able to both take it from the source systems, model it correctly, and push it back out. Some of the other pieces um, that you want to know, this isn't a passive system, it isn't just this, this record that sits there. Um, it can also feed things like your, your data warehouse. So if you think of your conformed dimensions maybe, and you have a dimension for customer, the MDM can feed that. So it's a nice way to get that single source and use it in things like your BI and your reporting. You can also use it as an active record in the systems, especially as you're at a higher level of maturity. So I'm, I'm in my sales system and someone calls in and I'm, I say, I'm Donna Burbank, and they can look up at the MDM and say, are you the Donna Burbank that lives at 123 Main Street? Well, yes, I am. Or maybe there's another. So you can actually, that helps with things like data quality as well, um, where you can actually take that clean record and use it in your patient systems or your customer systems, et cetera, et cetera. Because there is a component um, of data quality you'll see in those matching rules where we can either cleanse or augment. A lot of companies use sort of third-party data to kind of augment their MDM uh, party of record as well. Um, so uh, that, that's another feature of these MDM systems. Key to the architecture, though, is really understanding the governance and business process around it. Um, and so what we just showed is difficult, getting that architecture together is a challenge, but it's not you know, rocket science. If we have the right rules in place and we have the right architecture together, we can create some good matching rules and population rules to get that work. But this is something else I took from Gartner that some of the reasons that MDM uh, systems may fail, one of them is failure to align with business process and really start to understand the business value. So where is customer data used? We may have thought it was seven systems. We never asked the business users and mapped out the process. We realized that most of it comes through a form on the website that we hadn't seen, right? So really aligning it to the process and how it's used. And the other part is governance. So who is the one that decides the golden record? Who is the one can actually look at the record and see if that's the same John Smith, or they may just know, oh, no, that's John Smith's son, not the father. I know because I just spoke to them yesterday, right? So, how do they, you know, actually have that right level of human governance, either on stewardship to do the checks on those valid values, or, and or, all of the above, who creates the rules? Who, who decides how you match customer? Who decides where the, some of the records are and what the source is? And all of that really needs strong governance. So this alignment of process and governance is critical to really making this a success. So, which leads to this slide, that real successful governance is that sweet spot sort of between data architecture, process alignment and architecture, and data governance and stewardship. So the data architecture side, that's going to be your system architecture and your data flow and just the simplest step of what systems are we taking information from, how is data flowing today, and then how do we want to get that into the MDM system. What data models do we use? What are the fields for customer if we continue with that example? 
Um, what are the valid values for those fields? What is the data type for those fields? Is there a hierarchy? Say if we're looking at sales rep, is there sort of a reporting hierarchy or a geographic hierarchy or a product hierarchy is another common one. And then how do we do those match and merge and survivorship rules? How do I know it's the same John Smith? And if there's two choices, how do I pick the right one, right? And then how do I integrate that back into my system design? That's a, a good piece of work. Um, but if we look down at the lower left, I always integrate that with a process model. Where is this data used? How is data mapped to this process? Some of you may have heard me talk before, and you'll hear me again here about CRUD matrices or create, read, update, delete. Who, who right now is creating that information? Because you may find that seven systems are using customer name, but where's the one where maybe I was just working with a healthcare company? On intake of that customer, of that patient, that is where they got the name, address, and you know, date of birth, and those forms you fill out when you go to the doctor. But then the other systems are, have that information in them, but they're just reading it. They really should not be updating somebody's age uh, when they come in to get their blood pressure checked in this particular clinic, right? So you want to make sure that's enforced, and that helps with your master data. Who's up, who should be controlling it or updating it, and who should just be reading it, and when can this be deleted? Um, and then often you find as you go through those business processes, you can optimize the business process itself. What you don't want to do is take a paper process and put that same process in to your MDM system. You can probably optimize that. And then on the right, there's the accountability and stewardship. Who makes the rules? Who validates the rules? When there's a conflict of, of, a, of, of a code or a product or a customer, who makes, who makes that decision? And how do you prioritize some of these, these values and the implementation of it, especially I'm working with a a large international company and we're doing an MDM right now. The, one of the bigger questions, they're doing all of these, all of these stages, but even just do we do it by region, do we do it by department, and when you're thinking of, you know, I don't know, 20 countries and, and 65 departments and different business units, you know, it's, it's hard to get that right accountability and I'm a fan of kind of starting in pieces and moving out. Um, so how you prioritize, not only from data domain, but in terms of ownership and, and stewardship and, and uh, groups within the company. Those are all important. So this is just sort of a visual of what I mentioned too in terms of business process and, and they, you know, I, I often get kind of the feedback of all this architecture stuff. Doesn't this take a long time? We don't have time to do all of the full enterprise architecture. Maybe you don't, um, but do it in pieces. So, you know, I worked with a customer last month and there was a big problem. We literally just whiteboarded this <laughs> where we had the swim lanes and we said, okay, what, what, is the, what happens when the patient comes in? What do you do next? And we got so much valuable information. We took a picture of it and put it in a PowerPoint, <laughs> right? This wasn't a fancy, you know, BPM tool, but it made so much difference. If we had some aha moments, if I didn't realize that someone touches that data and someone else chimed in of, well, this is where the data is touched. And you'll see the swim lanes in terms of, which pieces of the department? Is it claims? Is it underwriting? If we're in insurance, and which, which different pieces of the puzzle are people touching? What happens in this person's daily job? And then what data is touched? And that can help um, sort of understand redundancies, conflicts. What you can also see here, um, and I'm a big fan of pictures. If you've seen my webinars before, you'll see the pictures. I, I will put in where there's a manual process with a piece of paper, or in this example, you'll see that an email was sent. Is that the ideal way? Uh, maybe we could put this in a system and have um, a lot of uh, MDM tools have great workflow capabilities. Could we make this a workflow in the MDM tool um, that can kind of automate some of these manual processes? So not only is process helpful in understanding data usage, it can also be helpful in designing your MDM system because workflow is such a key part of MDM. You want to make sure it's almost an as is to be. This is how data is entered today with this new MDM infrastructure how do we want workflow to work and where do people fit in this process? It isn't just this automated, we point the system to it and it magically works, right? I think you understand that, but you know, worth, worth calling that out. Um, so this other piece I mentioned, which is the horribly named but very helpful tool called the CRUD matrix. So it stands for create, read, update, and delete. And there's different ways you can do this. You can do it by system, you can do it by attribute, you can do it by entity, um, it would do it by department. For example, we're just talking about the product price. Who enters the price? Is it accounting that puts it in, but maybe marketing can update that? And finance reads it. But maybe you might come into some situations where two people think they're creating it. Well, then who's the master? Who, who's the main owner of that? Maybe it's a case-by-case -case scenario depending on whose quality is better, which is mastered. But you better at least talk about that before you implement the system, because that's often where things start to go wrong. 
is who owns it, who updates it. You don't want to overwrite a system that someone didn't realize this was being overwritten. Uh, here's an example of this, actually, in a real-world example that we did implement um, that worked out very well. So it was a restaurant company that I worked with, and their product was actually their menus, um, which to me was sort of a menu. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, it wasn't a shirt or a car. Or it was actually, you know, their product was their menu, and, and they were very innovative in their menu. Um, and they realized as they were kind of going through their digital strategy, they were trying to do a lot of more things with their data, they realized they did not have a central source of their menu data. I think one of the comments from marketing was that, I think our printer has a better master data than us, because they printed the menus, right? <laughs> so they knew. Um, so we did sort of all of the above that we mentioned. We did interviews with everyone from the chef that you see. He didn't quite wear that hat, but he, he sort of had his kitchen, and he created the menu. And his pieces of that, just like any product, it has components. So his components in that case were, were nutritional pieces of food, right? So is it the right slice of cheese? What are the menu um, instructions for this cheese? What's the nutritional value? Is there, are there any allergens associated with brie cheese versus American cheese? And, you know, any customer I go into, I'm amazed how much detail is important and little pieces of data that when you order your hamburger at the other end at the point of sale, uh, that that becomes important. And in this company, it actually did come important. So we went, actually went to the restaurants and kind of tested their point of sale system. But what had happened is they had sort of a, a new, um, in this case, I think it was a sandwich, um, and you could, on the point of sale system, switch out the ingredients. So they said, instead of American cheese, I want blue cheese, right? It's something I can do. But in this case, blue cheese cost a dollar more. <laughs> so they actually had a major um, kind of cost override because the person who was configuring the point of sale system was not aligned with the chef that said this sandwich can only have American cheese because we've worked with supply chain, we've worked with accounting, and it has a price for a certain reason. So anything, um, there's so many pieces of the puzzle that come into play with just clicking on a button and ordering your sandwich online. So with this company, they started with process. And they went through the business process and they mapped it out and they ran it through everyone, through the chef's kitchen, through marketing, through supply chain, to point of sale, to kitchen design, through everybody, and really created that single view and created the governance around that. Well, then who's going to own which piece of data and, and built the data model? So they did all of that before they even started with an MDM. They did use an MDM tool because I think a tool is important, but the tool is not the answer. They had to do all of this together. And at the end, there was a lot of happiness. The, the, the marketing was able to finally see all of the menu items and the correct source to do their marketing campaigns. Um, the chef was able to, instead of having to type in or write on a piece of paper the, the ingredients, he had an actually automated list because who knew this whole – food databases out there that you can check that gets you all of the ingredients and nutritional information and price and all of that, uh, not price, but the rest of that. Um, and then it could integrate that with supply chain because, as you may know, the, the complexity, is, the, or the, is that ingredient available in Canada in the summer? You know, maybe not, or maybe it is in the summer, but not the winter. So all of that was integrated in one central business process, um, data modeling, uh, workflow, and master data uh, and governance as well. So that was kind of a great success that we came in thinking we thought we were going to do master data. The more we looked at it, we realized it was a process and governance problem. Um, so here's a kind of a, a, a very meaty slide, I apologize, <laughs> but um, I think it sums up kind of that intersection of some of the architecture where master data management fits and where some of the governance roles come in. So at that top level, if we think of kind of that enterprise-wide prioritization, I'm a big fan of just starting with a conceptual data model. Something with, you know, when we're mastering customer, what do we mean by customer? Is it individual? Is it a company we're working with? Is it the holding company of the parent company or the individual stores? I mean, so many questions just about, at a very conceptual level, what are the main entities we're talking about? Also, it helps prioritize. We've got a you know, 100 main master data entities we could use in our company. What do we start with? Supplier, customer, patient, employee, um, student, you know, all, all of these. And then I'm a big fan of mapping that to, in this example, I say customer journey or logistics journey or student journey or patient journey or process model, whatever you want to call it. I think the hip way is kind of design thinking. A lot of I've worked with several companies that have something like a customer journey, um, which I did one recently with a, a student journey, which was kind of fun. Um, but that kind of puts the why 
and how into it. So you could do a lot of things, but how does this actually matter to, to a customer in their journey or a patient? And then help prioritize some of those subject areas and domains. And then, especially if you're an international company, how do you do that rollout? Do we do it all at once in a big bang? I may not recommend that. Do we start with one of our smaller company countries because it's easier and we'll have less risk? Or do we start with one of our larger countries because there's more value? None of, I can't answer any of those for you right now, right? That's where you're, those are all valid concerns. And your steering committee or your MD, your governance and MDM team need to get together themselves and prioritize that. And that's a combination of business, which is kind of the blue, uh, with your business data owners and your technical. So a data architect, I think they're a unique role that they can kind of talk technical and understand how you might structure some of this, um, but also talk business and understand hierarchies and business rules and things like that. So I would highly recommend starting there. Um, you don't want to start with the wrong domain or the wrong, you can come into a lot, you know, a lot of it comes down to prioritization and the right use case. And then on this business and technical alignment, I kind of broke those into kind of more of the businessy side and the technical side. So on the business side, just starting with that logical model, what even attributes do we start with? If we're talking about customers at name, address, date of birth, social security number, can we track that? All of those basic rules. And then what are the rules around that? How do we identify with match merge criteria, survivorship, harmonization? And again, that's sort of what we talked about before with getting, linking that with process and stewardship. So here, you're going to one level lower, where maybe there's a data domain steward or someone who understands that process or might understand that, hey, that works differently in Europe than it does in the US, which is different than Latin America. And, and based on your company, maybe it's a lot smaller than this or maybe it's even broader than this. But getting the right people in the room to ask those questions that you're not going to implement MDM and someone will say, oh, but we don't do it this way in Region X or the system you forgot or looking holistically at it. Um, and again, from the technical side, there in the green, you may have an enterprise data architect, you might have business analysts, you may have an MDM architect who's a little different than a data architect, enterprise data architect, whereas maybe the enterprise data architect might look holistically across all of the data and all of the priorities. An MDM architect gets a little bit nittier, grittier, <laughs> that's the word. And you know, how are we going to build the match merge criteria? How are the survivorship rules work? Are we going to do fuzzy matching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? There's a lot of very specific technical skills around that. Um, and they, you know, again, if you have a much smaller company, some of these people might be the same person in the, you know, one body, different role. Um, but larger companies, it often is important to even just break these out. And then at the technical level, there's a sort of physical data model and data quality um, uh, steps that help actually implement the hub itself. Um, so I'm a big fan of doing your data profiling. So we have a, we're picking these seven fields for customer and we're going to match on, I can uniquely identify my customers if we go by name and date of birth and address. And we do some profiling, we say, but date of birth is only filled in in 50% of the cases. It's empty half the time. Well, that might, we may want to change the rule. Either that's not the right rule, or we need to change the business process that people actually enter date of birth and they understand why, et cetera, et cetera. Do we want to start augmenting address? We don't know the address, but we can purchase that through a third party, or we can validate that through a third party. Um, can we create dashboards? I'm a, um, one thing I often implement in the Data Governance Committee is having a regular KPI dashboard. If we are matching on name, address, and date of birth, do we have a dashboard to know how good the quality of that data is? I'm making a business decision on these, just like I want a KPI of my sales data, I want a KPI of my data data, right? I want to understand the quality of the data that I'm using to make decisions on. Um, and then as we integrate data, you'll see this integration rules, publish and subscribe rules. I'm a big fan of that uh, CRUD matrix. And then the platform itself. And there's a lot of good tools in the market. Please don't ask me which one. You know I hate to answer that. Um, but um, in terms of pick the tool that is the right fit for you, your team, a lot of I've seen you can go look at the Gartner Magic Quadrant or the Forrester Wave and, and get some good. But is that the right fit for your tool? So what systems of your environment, what systems are you integrating in? Do you need to integrate with a CRM or a PIM or an e-commerce system? What, what's the level of maturity of your organization, um, of what the skills are needed? Some of the MDM tools can be very wizard-based. You don't need a lot of coding. Some need a lot of expertise. 
So you need to do that evaluation to make sure the tool matches for you. I have one customer that isn't using a tool at all, and they're, they're actually doing their own match merge rules. I personally would prefer to use a tool. I think they have done this before. A lot of these rules, the, the logic behind this can be kind of automated, and you can help yourself with there. But, you know, it's a functionality. You could build anything yourself. So there's a range, uh, but do that wisely because it has to match your environment. The, the tool that might be the highest in the magic quadrant might not fit your use case. And I know that's obvious, um, but I think there's a temptation, especially as you're selling up for um, to management with the joke you can't get fired for you know, buying IBM or w whatever. Um, there's an aspect of that because some of the newer, because this is so popular, there are some new vendors coming up. If it has some good functionality, they may not have as big of a user base, so that's something else to consider as well. Um, I am a big fan of stories and success, especially when there are success stories. <laughs> um, so this one I, um, I've talked about, I think, in the past and perhaps a different context. But I have been a fan of, of promoting this idea of mapping to the customer journey and the life cycle and also doing a full enterprise architecture, uh, but in a small phased approach. So this was a retailer we worked with in the U.S. Um, and they were doing a lot of exciting things. It was an Internet of Things enabled product. So they were building the data lake and they could actually get real-time data usage from how the customer used the product. They were trying to do a lot more with understanding the customer and loyalty programs and things like this. And they actually had an MDM system, um, but it wasn't working very well. So we took a step back and we said, well, why is not that working? They had one of the leading MDM tool vendors, nothing wrong with the tool, and what was implemented in the tool was fine. But they had not necessarily stepped back and took a holistic, when we mapped the customer journey and we started from the beginning, what do they do when they're just in the discovery phase? Um, do we know anything about, they may have visited the website, they may have visited a store and given information to the store. Um, and this actually was an actual use case. What would happen is they would go to the store, the high-end product, uh, so they would actually talk with a, a salesperson, and the first phase in the sales journey was the salesperson to get their name and email. Well. If, there, if any customers like me, you probably gave, yeah, I'm stupid at stupid.com because I don't want the salesperson to follow up with me. No offense to anyone who's in sales, but I'm not ready then. I just, I want to just look at your product, leave me alone. The problem was how the system was built, and, and probably rightly so, that email address cascaded across so that later when the person did buy the product, they put in the correct email, but the system, they kept the original. That was a classic crud. It was created and it was never updated. So when they called customer support, when their product didn't work or they hadn't, they couldn't get their product delivered, they weren't getting the email because they put in stupid stupid.com, right? Which could have been validated. I mean, there was a lot of different. Maybe it was a valid email, email but just they weren't looking at it, right? Um, and then they also had things the loyalty program. The person really liked the program uh, product and they signed up for the loyalty program and weren't getting the emails because it was never updated. I mean, literally, this was a classic map out the process see where the data is used. We picked that very small subcase, just saying where is email address used. And we looked across the system. We had a small governance committee on this one particular work problem. And I consider this one of the sale uh, successes in my career. And again, no, no, no disparagement to sales because, you know, we all have to sell at some point in our lives. Um, but we had the head of sales after we discussed this problem and saw how the data flowed through the system, and a lot of it came from the initial email. He's like, well, I need to incent my, train my people and govern my people, I think he even used the word govern, to get that correct email from the beginning. And there are other ways we can force the right email, et cetera, et cetera. He never would have said that because he didn't, until he understood the downstream impact of putting in the wrong email. So that was a case that nobody was doing anything out of malice. Everyone was busy with specific tasks. No one had sort of stepped back and looked holistically at the business process, the, the governance around the data, and the architecture around the data to really see that holistic view. Once they did, it was an easy fix. The technical fix was not necessarily that difficult. The hard part was seeing holistically and getting the right people in the right room to make the decision. So I know that was sort of a long-winded um, example, but I think it shows a good example of how they could get all of those pieces together by just picking a small use case and getting all of those pieces of an enterprise architecture together. The other piece that we sort of didn't have in the story, they were using IoT data and they really wanted to get that information, but they weren't able to easily link that back to a customer, um, partly because of security issues, but also they didn't have that customer record. So once they were able to do that, they were able to kind of do that new next generation sexy stuff because they were able to kind of do the core MDM style stuff. I know stuff is a very technical word, but 
Um, so in summary, I, I will say that master data is on the rise. More and more people are looking to get that common, consistent source of information, whether it's customer, product, supplier, employee, patient, et cetera, et cetera, student. Um, but really, to be successful, you need to start integrating that into your wider data architecture with process and governance around it, because it really can have a good, positive impact on the business. If this was of interest to you, you may be interested in next month in October, which is on uh, data modeling, uh, business-centric data modeling, which I know is always a hot topic. We always have a good uh, turnout there. Um, and the, the web white paper that I mentioned is available on our website where it does talk not only about MDM, but a lot of the other trends in the market about master data and metadata and architecture. So you may, it's free, so you may be interested in downloading that as well. Um, so without further ado, Shannon, we can, um, this is a little bit about us, we do this for a living, but we can open it up for questions if people had any comments or questions about MDM. Everyone's really quiet today, Donna. I wonder if everyone's distracted by television, <laughs> news <laughs> events. <laughs> <laughs> but um wow, this is a rare I think this is a first that we've never I know before. I know it's <laughs> it is rare um but I will you know the most commonly people ask about uh slides and, and recording and just a reminder that I will send a follow up by end of day Monday for this presentation with links to the slides the recording and anything else requested but yeah everyone's just super quiet any questions out there Great, not a problem. So I will put, I notice often we find a lot of people, maybe it is because of news cycles, um, people do catch us after the fact and get their recording, which is I think is a great um, feature of Dataversity. I've gone back myself, I never have time during the day, so I have watched a lot of my colleagues' webinars at night and that sort of thing. If you do have any questions or concerns, don't hesitate, my email is on this uh, slide. Maybe that was risky. <laughs> um, but I do have people who said, yeah, I caught, I caught it a few weeks later and I have a question. And you know, if I don't ask you, it's, uh, I, I apologize because I'm busy, but I do generally have a pretty good tech record if it's a little bit late, um, if you do have something that kind of caught your interest. Well, we do um, have a couple ones. All right. Yeah. Oh, I was gonna say we do have a couple questions coming in now, and of course I will send out your your contact info in the follow up email as well. So, um, uh, so where would you start if you were uh, coming into a new business engagement? Um, I would start uh, basically uh, where with some of those core practices I mentioned with with starting with the well, actually I'll go back to my favorite slide. You just wanted me to put up the slide. Thank you for that. No. Um, Really looking holistically at the big picture architecture. Um, sorry, gosh. Um, but basically starting with the business question of the why. Why are we doing this? What are the business goals? Because sometimes one of the hardest questions is even what to master. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can use my own slide. Uh, um, looking at that general business strategy, where are we trying to head? What's the most important um, data to govern? And then we would start out with kind of a system. What systems does that data come through? So maybe we decide it's patient data. We don't have a good set. What systems does that come from? What business processes are touching that data? Um, and, and then do a very high level data model of that. So high data model of the source systems, data model of the target systems, and really try to get some of those rules around what are the fields we want to master? I would not boil the ocean. Maybe start with something small. Um, and then how do I do the matching rules and do some data quality checks on that? So if these are the fields I want to master, is my, because you may, it may be the right re, uh, answer to wait a little bit. I want to do this matching. Our data quality isn't good enough yet. Maybe I need to go back and get the quality right. Or maybe MDM can help with that quality. And I would definitely have a governance, if you don't have a governance organization in place, this may be a great time to start it, because it's not going to succeed if you don't have the governance to get the right people looking at the data to A, make those matching rules, um, or, uh, to actually look at the data coming in um, to say, is this the right match? So the rules are very important. So you want to get, you don't want this to be an IT led initiative. Definitely having the business involved is key. So um, could you address the difference between reference data and MDM once more? Yes, and I'm not going to try to move my slide because I, for those who might think I'm an idiot, I'm on somebody else's laptop with this really tiny screen and I can't hit the button on the slide. Um, but I did have one, so and it could, in a bit, it's an academic, um, but sometimes it's not. So I would say 
Refer reference data is in the sense that it's smaller. So that might be your country codes, your, your uh, state codes, your procedure codes. And in some cases, you may say a product code, that's a core aspect of the business. There's often transactional data around that. So a customer product, your big buckets, where there's a lot of different systems, uh, tends to be changing more. Um, those would be your your master data. I would say reference data are generally smaller, slow, more slowly changing data sets, whereas you know, I may change my address more often than I may change a state code in the U.S., if that makes sense. Um, and often you, sometimes, and not a rule, you may get those from a third party, some of your references. It's more of a reference, if that, almost by the name of it, you reference certain data. Uh, your master data is the ones that are actually running your business, your customers, your products, your suppliers, things like that. Have you seen um, any implementations in big data or in data lakes? Yes. I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. So uh, don't get me started. I'm old enough to start my rant. Um, of it doesn't a data lake does not replace master data. It is augmented by it. So um, just today, I'm actually on a client site, and that's what we're, we architected on the whiteboard behind me, right? So that we want to get a holistic view, in this case, as customer, of Internet of Things streaming data from one of their products, from social media data, also make sure it's the right customer for a policy, um, right? So this is an insurance company. So um, part of that lives on the lake. I, I would definitely want to land some of the social media data. I might not know how to use that. But I can't leverage that big data unless I have a master data. So I see the master data living outside the lake, or depending on how you define your lake, if it's a loose ecosystem. I wouldn't put your master data on Hadoop. Um, or, you know, there's a different use case, or AWS bucket, right? <laughs> the, the master that sort of needs that either relational or graph or that logic behind it. But then you can integrate some of those bigger data um, artifacts into your master data. One more success or actually a different um, customer, but also in insurance, they did this really interesting big data like screen scraping of some of their high net worth customers. Well, could be creepy. Um, what are they doing online? Do they order, are they getting lawsuits? Are they own any companies? They did all this great analysis. Problem came when they tried to match it with the actual customer. Is this Bill Gates the billionaire or Bill Gates that lives on 101 May Street is in the debt? And the way, the reason the lake part broke down is they didn't have good master data match with. So I see them as separate, don't mix the two, but they definitely augment each other that the master data could help feed that lake and do some analysis on your customers. So sometimes the MDM discussions sound um, best suited to a warehouse environment, but for companies trying to govern a big, messy data lake, what effective strategies have you seen? Um, I would not agree with that first statement. It's not only for warehousing. Uh, it could be for real-time operational systems. Um, it could be for uh, late-type information. I want to get customer sentiment analysis, right? And I want to under, but you still have to, you still have to master somewhere who your customers are, right? So I, I do think that core logic of and you could do it in a very lightly and high for something, I wouldn't recommend it. But you, wherever you do it, you have to have very uh, specific rules and governance around what rules we match on, how do we do the survivorship, et cetera. So I don't see it as an old, uh, only for data warehousing. I see it, I think some of the drive for MDM is ironically, not ironically, but interestingly, because of some of these new technologies, the more I'm using customer data, I have to pretty much make sure that I have one, one record for my customer, single source of truth. Does that make sense? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so in your experience, Dono, at what level do you normally see a champion for pushing the need for metadata management across an organization? I will assume they mean master data, but I will put them both together. Um, but those words are so similar, but obviously they're different things. So I would think it has to be driven from the executive level, it has to be top down for anything. Could be meta, it could be master, it could be anything. But it can't stop there. And I've seen, I've seen both. It has to be at the very top level. It has to be at the management level or implementation level. The sort of because it, those are the people at the coal face, so to say, that are actually doing it every day. And it has to be at the actual, even from the data entry of the clerk at the front level. Everyone has to understand this. Because I've seen success from the executive level, and they say, go make it happen. <laughs> but if the soldiers aren't listening and the general says it, it's not going to work. Um, and if all the, the soldiers are saying it, but the general isn't bought in, it really has to be across the board, obviously at a different level. 
but it's, it's, just, it's just, you know, hopefully that clerk in the beginning, is, MDM just makes his or her job easier and they just see the result of it. But in some cases they are involved either in the looking at the, the fields or making sure the fields are put in correctly, et cetera, et cetera. So it's across the board, it's all pieces. And uh, from the technical standpoint, what challenges um, could one expect in an MDM implementation? I, um, so it could be, make sure you're getting all the right sources um, and you haven't forgotten one, which is kind of a process but also a technical. I think um, making sure that you get the right set of data elements, that the data types are right. I mean, some of this is just kind of boring housekeeping, but it's so important. Do I have, um, what's the longest length of my surname or last name, right? You can, you can go things wrong there. I think the trickiest one, though, is, is this idea of the survivorship, the matching rules, how tight you want to get that. So, for example, I could say I'm Donna Burbank and I live at 101 Main Street, and then there's a Donna L. Burbank. Well, probably 95% probability it's the same person. We can auto-match that, right? And that could be fine, um, but maybe I have uh, strange parents and a sister named Donna Louise. Actually, <laughs> a guy I dated, like, too much information, <laughs> a guy I dated in college, he had three sisters and they were all named Maria. It's their first name. It was a Portuguese culture uh, and they all had different middle names. So that might be a great example. There was Donna Louise and Donna Mary and Donna Elizabeth. And they all, so they would have had a very poor match, right? So you need to understand your customers and you want, don't want to overmatch um, that then all of his sisters would have had the same email and that then the and they're not, they're different people. You don't want to undermatch. Um, I also had the case where they made the rules so loose that they had poor business people checking a thousand entries every day and it failed because people were sick of having to check that many. So I think where it gets tricky is all, everything else I said, you probably nodded your head, you're like, yeah, whatever, obviously. But I think where it gets hardest is getting that matching right. You don't want to be so tight um, that you, you make people review too much, you don't want to be so loose that you over approve and, and get the wrong match. And one more quick story, sorry, in the protecting the innocent names, but it actually it was a healthcare company and we had a very junior person and his role was to check the matching rules. He's like, no problem, I think there was only three that were wrong I and mean, that's not bad, we had a million patients. I'm like, yeah, but this is a patient going into surgery. I want to make sure that if they're cutting off my leg, it's the right Donna Burbank and not somebody else's leg. Um, so in some cases, you have to, I mean, for business reasons, you have to have a, you know, absolute, maybe you do want everything reviewed, right, in that case. So that, I think, is the trickiest thing to get right, technically, is that matching rule. Sure. So um, do we need MDM if we don't have any or little silo information? That is a good information. Um, so in some cases, and, and I was just talking about this before this call, um, you may have, I really only have a CRM. I absolutely am a small company and this is the only system I have. It doesn't integrate with anything else. You probably could get away with that, but you, you need to understand that. Um, is there data quality rules on that? Or maybe I just have, I'm really small and I have a SQL Server database. It has all my brokers in it, all my salespeople in it. I know it's right. That's all I need. I don't need to push it out to anything else. Those are some of the, do I need to integrate with any other system? If no, not. Do I have the right matching and cleansing rules on it and I'm doing the right, you know, if more than one people are searching on it, uh, entering it? So, fine. Um, and is it complete and consistent and accurate? In that case, it may be yes. You don't want to over-engineer if it does, but, but I would just be careful that there really is only one system. It's only used by, and I found that to be rare um, because even if you have, you think you have a CRM, but then someone's pushing it out to the constant contact marketing system, et cetera. So part of it, if you, when you start to think of it more of a hub to push out, uh, that might come in. But yeah, you don't necessarily need to over-engineer. You don't need to do it for every domain. Maybe for customer, I want a master, but for my locations, I, I, I know the locations of my store. They're in a database. It's fine. There's no question. Don't over, in a perfect world, you would, but you don't need to for every single domain. Just pick your battles, if you know what I mean. Indeed. So, you know, Donna, I love this question. New MDM tools are changed to be called MDG, Master Data Governance. Should MDM and data governance be combined into one function? Um, they're related functions. I see them as, as a bit, but uh, how we word it, they should be closely aligned. Um, 
in some cases you want an enterprise governance and then there's master data governance that's different because that might be different than your, I don't know, application development governance for et cetera, et cetera. So I, I see them, so there's different roles with an MDM, but governance is a strong part of it. So uh, I don't want to say it depends, but I, I do, I mean, this is the architecture part of MDM, but they should be aligned with governance. So that doesn't bother me that they're calling it the same thing. I, I think if it's giving more visibility to, to governance and you're making sure they're aligned, yes. Are they slightly different things? I think governance will be broader than just MDM. That'll probably be my answer to that, because um, you're looking at policy and procedures and across the whole organization. But the fact that they're aligned, 100% aligned, is a good idea, because you can't, you can't do them separately. It's worse to not have governance. <laughs> um, so yeah, aligning them together is, is fine. So do you think that managing MDM in a database focused on relationships, like a graph database, would facilitate matching? It doesn't facilitate matching, but it's a good, I, so there's the, I think I, there was a webinar we did a few months ago that I actually talked about this. So how you match is still going to be difficult or the, heavy, or the same questions because you have to sort of match up. That almost is more of your classic relational, how do these fields match up? But the beauty of a graph database is to be able to, once you've found those matches, to get some hidden relationships, I think, that maybe householding, for example. I know these three people are related in a, um, you know, a pattern, or I'm seeing that phone call patterns to one group, et cetera, or fraud detection and things like that. I don't think it helps with some of that core matching, because to me that's a logic. That said, I'm a big fan of graph because you can get some of those relationships. Um, it's almost like you do the, the matching in a more traditional mindset, I mean, relational mindset, and then the graph helps you once you have that. It's almost like that big data question in my mind earlier. You have to do the hard core, and then you can start linking it to everything else. Um, but how I matched Donna Burbank, whether she was born on May 1st, then that, that's sort of beyond graph. That's just kind of how you match the field, if you know what I mean. All right, Donna, well, that's all the questions we have today. We're very close to the top of the hour here. So just a reminder to everyone, uh, we will, I will be sending out a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this presentation with links to the slides, links to the recording. Uh, and uh, Donna, again, thank you so much for another great presentation. We hope that we can see all, you all next month. And thanks to every, all of our attendees for being so engaged. I love all the questions that came in today. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, Donna. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Cheers. Bye.